We have an Alexandra. Will you please state your name and your where you live, and you have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a resident of Providence. I live here, I pay taxes here, and attend school at Rhode Island College. I live in Ward 13. And Can you hear it? Yes, please proceed. Okay, should I start over? Uh, we heard your name and where you live, and so yeah, I guess you could start over. I live in Ward 13, and my council member is Rachel Miller. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You have the mic. Okay. Uh, I am writing in today as a white resident of the city to confirm that I no longer accept that any of my tax money be put towards funding a service that harasses, disenfranchises, and actively destroys the lives of black and brown community members. The city of Providence must defund its police department. For decades in this country, police officers have been praised as the pinnacle of public safety when in reality they protect private property much more graciously than they do human lives. White neighborhoods and individuals are, and historically have been, allowed a hollow sense of comfort by the police. It is time for white people to open ourselves up to the imaginative process of eliminating the need for a police presence in this country. With the guidance of local organizations such as Direct Action for Rights and Equality, DARE, Providence Youth Student Movement, PRISM, Alliance to Mobilize Our Resistance, AMOR, Providence Student Union, PSU, and Black and Pink Providence, I reject that 17% of our total city budget, $88 million, would be directed towards the police department. I implore the city council and Mayor Olorza to cut the budget by, at the very least, su suspending the use of paid administrative leave for cops under investigation of excessive force, withholding pensions, a $31 million line item for cops involved with excessive force, requiring cops, not the city, to be liable for misconduct settlements, removing all school resource officers from Providence Public Schools, and as quickly as possible, reducing police force size. This is all with the end goal of disbanding the Providence Police Department and investing in community health, education, and affordable housing. I join the chorus of voices who demand that zero dollars be spent on police reform. This includes a rejection of increased money for training, new police hires, and or technology, and this includes body cameras. I suggest that Providence leadership ask itself two simple questions queried by scholar and career prison abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore. What are the conditions under which it is more likely that people will resort to using violence and harm to solve problems? And what can we do about it so that there is less harm? With these thoughts in mind, it is obvious that economic injustice and inequality, lack of suitable schooling, medical care, and mental health assistance, lack of access to public housing and living under constant threat of city and state surveillance are conditions that might lead someone to resort to violence and harm. What can we do about it? We can fund, fund, fund organizations and programs that combat these inequalities and we can rid ourselves of institutions that uphold them. This is a very short statement that is part of a much longer, indeed constant conversation that our city, our country, and our communities must have. Thank you for listening today, and thank you to the organizers on the ground in Providence who have worked to bring the public's attention, mine included, to this problem. With a particular thank you to the black and brown women and femmes who lead this charge and whose guidance is invaluable. We must defund and ultimately abolish the police. Thank you very much.